And welcome to Cornerstone this rainy day. We're really glad that you all are here to join us. John chapter 20 verse 1 says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. As Christians, we know what that meant. When that stone was rolled away, it meant that our Savior, Jesus Christ, had risen from the dead. And today we're going to celebrate that resurrection. So please, if you're able, stand and join us as we celebrate and praise our risen Savior.
us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning, church. Just a few announcements real quick. I'm kind of short. Some of y'all probably can't even see me. Sorry. That's okay. It just reminds me how short I am. All right. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, so our first announcement is that our fall family outing at Mary Mead is coming up October 13th. There's more information about that in your bulletins, and there's also a sign-up for it in the library. So just be aware of that because you don't want to miss it. Also, on the topic of our building expansion, which is an exciting topic. If you missed the meeting and you would like to see the fly-through video, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, the architect has designed this video where we are able to walk through a building and fly over it, uh, this building that does not yet exist. So if you would like to see that, that is available on our YouTube channel. So you can go and check that out at any time, but not right now. Um, also, Q&A sessions for anyone who has questions that they'd like to ask about the building. Uh, the Q&A sessions will be October 15th and November 19th, and they'll be after the worship service that morning in room 
1. And we're taking pledge cards. You can pick them up in the foyer. And we are taking them all the way up to December 10th. So just be aware of that. And for more information, you can also visit our website. Also, Operation Christmas Child, uh, which our church has done for several years now. We're going to be doing that again this year, and we will have more information on Operation Christmas Child, which is where we pack these shoe boxes for children who are living in poverty, and it's an opportunity for them to receive Christmas presents, and also it's a door uh, to share the gospel with them. And so more information on that will be available next week. We'll also, Lord willing, have the boxes out for you next week. And so just be aware of that. Um, Those are all of our announcements. So let's turn now to a time of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love. Lord, you are a great God. Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of Moses and Elijah, God of the apostles who came before us, let it be known this day that you are Lord of all and that we are your servants, and that what we do, we do at your word and in service to your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to have a genuine love that abhors what is evil and holds fast to what is good. I pray that you would use our church in a mighty way here in this community. I pray that our brothers and sisters, even outside of our church, would rise up with us and stand up for Jesus in genuine love. I pray that you would help us to not be hateful toward those who who don't know what they are doing. That we would not hate the lost people of this world, but that we would see them as you do, as sheep in need of a shepherd. We pray that you would help us as we stand up for you and contend for the faith once for all handed down to the saints. That we would show your love to this world. I pray that you would grant us all a righteous courage especially as we find those, especially those that find themselves in the midst of turmoil. Lord, that we pray that you would be glorified in our church, in our community, in our country, and around the world. We pray that as we draw near to you this morning in worship, that you would bless us and that we would honor you. We ask these things in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. not we're gonna have scripture reading first (laughs) well this week we resume 12 weeks of reading through our statement of faith up on the screen behind me will be the first point in our statement of faith i will read it out loud and then we'll consider god's word in light of it and then we'll stand and all read it together the first point in our statement of faith says we believe the bible is the inspired word of god that it is inerrant, infallible, and the final authority for life and faith. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for tra- and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The great reformer Martin Luther said this once when he's standing in the, uh, on trial for his words that he had written down for that salvation is by grace through faith in Christ alone. And Martin defended himself this way. He said, Unless I am convinced by the testimony of Scripture or by clear reason, I am bound by the Scriptures that I have quoted and my conscience is captive to the Word of God. I cannot and will not recount, recant anything. Here I stand, I can do no other. God help me. Luther does as we do today, stand on the word of God. This is one of the great solos of the Protestant faith that is sola scriptura. It is scripture alone which holds our authority. It is not the preaching of any man, it is not the creeds or councils of any group but rather it is scripture alone. You know, I think sometimes we probably get accustomed to having this Bible in our hands or in our pockets. We forget the great privilege it is that God would tear open the heavens and condescend to us to speak to us. 
God has not left us without his word for our lives. How might we know to live correctly in this world? How do we know right from wrong? How do we know the way of salvation? It is only found in the word of God. And so we begin our statement of faith at Cornerstone with the word of God. Because without it, we have no basis for faith. We have no basis for our preaching and our teaching. It is why we sing the word of God. It is why we pray the word of God. The scriptures are the reason we preach from the word of God. So will you stand with me and recite our statement of faith, the first point of it, together. We believe the Bible is the inspired word of God, that it is inerrant and infallible and the final authority for life and faith. Let us worship in light of that word. Now we'll continue our worship in song. Please join us.
Deuteronomy 31 8. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Praise the Lord for our children's choir. As the children make their way out, I want to give the parents who may still have children in the room about a 90-second alert that uh, the next portion of our service will be rated PG-13. The sermon will be rated PG, uh, but we have a little bit of an announcement, something to cover, that will be rated PG-13. Be careful, little ears. What you hear, we always want our parents to know uh, that things like that are coming. And so if your parent and, and PG-13 may be a little too much, you can walk out in the foyer until you see me back up here uh, preaching. Uh, one of the things I'm going to do in a moment is invite our family pastor, Travis Dykes, up here uh, to cover uh, something going on on the hearts and minds of many in our church family and in our community. And I also want to let you know that in, in the family ministry that's going on here, 
We had a special guest come this morning, uh, Barbara Roquet from Coventry Christian Schools, uh, who spoke and gave a presentation in both of the adult Sunday school classes this morning about how we can send tax dollars towards uh, people who want to go to Christian schools, who may be considering other options for their children. We want to support our families wherever their kids go to school, even if they're homeschooling. We want to come alongside all families here because parents are the primary disciple makers of their children. And this church is to equip the saints for all ministry, including raising children. And so, Travis, come on up. And when you're done, you can pray, and I'll come back up. Good morning. So this, as Pastor Dave said, is one last announcement that we do have. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you already know this. Some may not. But there is a major debate going on at Perk. Uh, Valley High School, and it has resulted in no less than three heated school board meetings and a 400-student walkout protest, and it has even made national news networks. The issue is over whether or not young men who identify as young women should be allowed to use the girls' restroom and be allowed in other girls' spaces. The young man who organized the walkout is actually coming from a Christian worldview and has been prompted to take a courageous step in standing up for Jesus. And we know that this issue is far from over. The school continues to debate this and what its policy might be. But it's also much bigger than PV High School. All of our students in public schools are dealing with this on some level. And we know it can be difficult, particularly when you're young, to take a stand for Jesus. It can be difficult. It can be frightening. See, they tell you that you're being unloving and even hateful. But we know that genuine love, real love, abhors what is evil and clings to what is good. We love people. We love them well by clinging to what is good. It is not a loving thing to affirm an ideology that is hurting people. And the transgender ideology is hurting people, I assure you. We love people who identify as transgender. As Christians, as a church, we love people who identify as transgender. And we love them too much, again, to affirm an ideology that is hurting them, causing them harm, causing them spiritual, physical, emotional harm. We love them too much to affirm that. And we love everyone else enough to look out for their privacy and security and, yes, even their safety. We have a love that is real and genuine. We have a counter-cultural love. So students, stand up for Jesus, even when they tell you that you're being hateful. Because you are not hateful. You have a real and genuine love. Another tactic that the world uses is to make you feel like you are all alone in following the Lord. And that takes a toll on anyone. It took its toll on Elijah who said to the Lord, I alone am left. He said this in relation to so many of the people of God bowing down to the idol Baal. But the Lord assured Elijah that there were still 7,000 in Israel who had not bowed the knee to Baal. Friends, we should never say, I alone am left. We should never have that sentiment. God has left far more than 7,000 in this world who have not bowed the knee to the rainbow flag. The church of Christ is great and mighty, and it is growing around the world, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Students, look around you this morning. Seriously, look around at the people in this room. You are not alone. 
And I want to remind you of the fact that you are not alone. And that's why I'm telling you this now instead of waiting until tonight at our youth Bible study. We have your back. You have brothers and sisters in Christ in this room, some of whom you don't even know their names. People that are far removed from high school age. And I can tell you that I have heard from them. And they have labored in prayer over you. They love you and are here for you. I'm here for you. The other elders are here for you. All of us here, your church family, we're here for you and we have your back. And if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, then he is at the right hand of the Father and he is interceding for you. You have the Holy Spirit indwelling you. So don't be afraid to stand up for Jesus in genuine love. And if you're looking for a simple way to take that first step of faith, that first step, rather, of courage in front of your peers to show your faith, this Wednesday is See You at the Poll, which is a global day of prayer for students Uh, to gather at the flagpole in front of their schools and pray for their school, their community, and country. So I hope you go, and I hope you'll stand up for Jesus in genuine love. And we, your church family, are here for you. We're, We're praying for you, and we love you. Let's pray. Father, humble us. Give us wisdom. Help us love our neighbors as ourselves. Help us receive your word on every issue as a glorious and loving gift from your hands. And help us shine your light into darkness so that people may find Jesus and come to know how much you love them. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Will you please turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. If you don't have a Bible with you, we have a stack of Bibles in the foyer. Take one home. Uh, we would love for you to have a Bible if you don't have one. And if you want to give a Bible away or five, take five and give them away. But it is reprinted on the back of your bulletin. And before I read our text for this morning which is the first 10 verses of John 20. Uh, Let me tell you a story. I want to tell you a story of a man who was in darkness who found the light of Jesus. And this is a man who has uh, moved out of our region but used to be a member at our church. I'm not going to say his name. But he shared this at a men's breakfast one time. Uh, He and his wife had moved into a new apartment complex and uh, the next door neighbors were Christians. And one of the first things these Christians did was they walked over and knocked and gave them a Christian book and and said, why don't you read this? And so the guy was like, oh, no, I have Jesus freak neighbors. Oh, no. And so that book went on his coffee table for months, and he mocked it, and he laughed at his neighbor. How silly of a neighbor who believes in these fairy tales of Jesus Christ. Until one day, he opened the book and read the first page and found the light of Jesus Christ. He went from darkness into light. It changed his marriage. It changed his future. It changed his career goals. It gave him hope like he never had before. He was in darkness, and his testimony is that he mocked the light and those who loved Jesus until he saw the light. And by grace through faith, he trusted Jesus. When we move from darkness to light, it changes our lives. And we live in a world with darkness all around, but the light will not be stopped, which we're going to see in our text this morning. Let me pray, and then I'll read John 20, 1 through 10. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the light. We feel it particularly this morning because it's dim out. 
It's cloudy, it's rainy. It's not too bright outside. The lights feel bright in this room, and yet it feels a little darker than normal. And yet the light of your son Jesus is shining bright. You have prepared light for us from your word to receive as a good gift from your hand. So thank you for preparing this message and this worship service for our hearts you lovingly prepared to nourish us with your truth. So help us eat this feast now as we hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. The Gospel of John chapter 20, verses 1 through 10. This is the good and glorious light of our God. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early. While it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw And believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. I'm betting that this week, as you went through whatever the Lord had planned for you, you did not think, I cannot wait to hear a message about a folded face cloth. Was that on your radar? Some of you know on the back of our bulletin, it tells you the text for the following week so you can see what we're going to preach on next week. But actually that clothing there, that folded face cloth, is a piece of evidence to the greatest thing that ever happened in the history of the world when the entire world filled with darkness finally had evidence that the light had defeated the darkness. So in our text, there's three things. There's darkness, running, and clothing. And all three of these will help us understand what was happening. Darkness, running, and clothing. First, darkness. The world is full of darkness. Do I have to convince you? If you watch the news at all, how many of you, after an hour of news, I don't know why you would even do that to yourself, think, this is a great place. I love what's going on. No, because for the news to keep you coming back, they want you angry and afraid. Be afraid about this and be angry enough to come back tomorrow to find out who to be angry at tomorrow. Darkness isn't fun to talk about. It's profitable to talk about, but not fun. And how many of you love darkness? Okay, good. No hands. If one or two had gone up, I would have been really worried. I saw a motivational poster once. You know those office motivational posters like teamwork, and there's a picture and then a little quote underneath it. There are some that are demotivational posters, and one of them I saw online. It's a dark picture of a dark night, and there's you know not much you can see in the picture. And the key word is despair, and the catchphrase at the bottom is, it's always darkest just before it goes pitch black. Darkness isn't fun. But if we understand what happened on the first Easter, we have to remember that the whole world was dark. There was no hope. There was no peace. The Pax Romana was the offer from the Roman emperors to the people. Submit to us. Show allegiance to us. Send all your money to us. Obey us. Never step out of line. Never question the lordship of Caesar or you will end up on a cross. And if you do all that, you have peace. That was the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome offered by the Roman government. There was no peace. There was fear and submission and a tomb that on that first Easter was empty. 
because the world was full of darkness. And Easter begins with darkness. And yes, it's literal darkness because it was early in the morning, but it's more than that. And we know as we've read John's gospel together over the past few years, light is a theme of John. Light is one of the biggest themes of John. When you're reading the gospel of John, notice when he brings up light and darkness. And here on the biggest day in history, there was still darkness. Look at verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. Okay, stop there. Of course, it was literally still dark. But we know John is writing light, dark, light, dark. It was dark outside, but Mary Magdalene had not yet come to see the true light, had not yet come to understand that the ultra, ultimate darkness surrounding the events of the world was going to be stopped by the events that she was witnessing. Mary was still in darkness, just like the world around us is. Uh, think about figure out truth for yourself. And we see the increase in despair and depression and confusion. The world right now, without Jesus, is stuck in the same situation Mary Magdalene is as we turn to verse 1. Think about Mary Magdalene. She got to the tomb first on Sunday morning, but her weekend had been ruined. The previous week was full of hope. Hope that Jesus was the Messiah. Look at what happened on Palm Sunday. They ushered him in and they were singing Hosanna. They thought he would deliver the people. They thought he would conquer the Romans and bring, bring true peace, bring true Pax to Romana. And the Israelites would have their Independence Day. But instead of all that on Friday, something else happened. And Mary Magdalene and all of the disciples saw Jesus die. And it wasn't quick, and it wasn't painless, and it wasn't pretty. And after Friday, Saturday was silent. The Jewish Sabbath day ends. And so after the Sabbath, Saturday night, Mary goes to buy burial spices for a proper burial the next morning, Easter Sunday. And so for Mary Magdalene and the other women who were with her that we know from other Gospels, this story is not light breaking in. This is the end of a funeral. This is the end of a very painful, confusing funeral. And on top of all the pain she was going through, all the darkness she was facing, somebody moved the stone. Look at the end of verse 1. And she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So it's a funeral, it's dark out, there's mourning, there's darkness, and now there's confusion to top it all off. Darkness is the first thing we see. Darkness, like a world full of darkness without the hope of Jesus. But since we're reading John's gospel, we're used to hearing him talk about darkness and light. Because Jesus is the light. We have hints all through the gospel of John to pay attention for this exact moment. In John 8, verse 12, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 1, 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John 1, 8, John the Baptist, a different John, it says he was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. Like when we go out into the community, we are there to bear witness about the light. We're not the light, but Jesus is. And John 1, 9, the true light, which gives light to everyone, the offer is there for everyone, was coming into the world. So darkness is the theme. All around us, the world is dark. Evil is being celebrated Hate and crime and selfishness are on the rise. There's confusion, there's lying, there's corruption. There's the worship of created things rather than the creator. And as a result of all that darkness around us, we're getting what we would expect. Depression is higher than ever. Confusion is getting more confusing. And I saw a study from earlier this year. I read it this week. It's almost unbelievable. Listen to this stat. 44% of college students are depressed or in despair. 44% of college students are depressed or in despair. 
of the children being raised in this culture get to their first year of college depressed or in despair? What are we doing to them? Of course they are. Darkness is winning in some areas. And when you take God out of the picture, you get more darkness because Jesus is the light. And if Jesus is not there, there will not be light. There will only be darkness. When you try to get rid of Jesus from an area of your life, like your phone, I want to have my life, but I don't want Jesus anywhere near what I do on my phone. Well, when you remove Jesus from your phone, you turn the light switch off. When you remove Jesus from your neighborhood, you turn the light switch off. When you remove Jesus from your family dinners, you turn the light switch off. When you remove Jesus from your family get-togethers, from your heart, from your schedule, it's turning the light switch off. It's true for our heart, our home, our office, our school districts, our state, our courts. Mary Magdalene on the first Easter was still in the dark. Just for a few more moments, she was sad, confused, and shaken like a dark world without Jesus. And so she runs. She runs for an answer. First, we have darkness, which the world is in without Jesus until the moment we are about to talk about. Well, second, we have running. How many of you like running? All right, more hands than those of you who like darkness. Still not 20, though. I don't like running either. Second, we have running. Look at verse 2. Remember, Mary's confused. She's in darkness. She's like the world without knowing the hope of Jesus. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, we know this to be John, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Stop there. Mary was running. The tomb was empty. She had confusion and she had questions. Her first guess was probably, uh, uh, maybe the tomb was robbed. Grave robbery was a common crime in the first century. Uh, Grave robbery and grave destruction was such a big problem that in the middle of the first century, one of the emperors made it a capital offense to rob or disrupt a grave. That means the death penalty for grave robbery. So grave robbery was common enough. Uh, Mary was probably thinking maybe the tomb was robbed. Maybe the tomb was robbed. But she didn't go in to see the evidence that we're going to talk about in a minute. Her question was, where is the body now? She knew there had been a body. She knew where Jesus was laid. And she knew it wasn't there. So she's running for an explanation and probably thinking, oh no. The grave of the man that we followed and put our hopes in has been desecrated and robbed. So she ran. That's what you do when you're in distress or confusion or in fear. And she runs to Peter and John and tells them the news. Not... He is risen, which we say on Easter here, and which we'll say at the end today. But she says the tomb is empty. But she doesn't mean the tomb is empty because he is risen. She means the tomb is empty. Oh no, what happened? So it's almost the Easter announcement. This news in itself is not life-changing. The tomb of Jesus is empty. Well, there could be many explanations for that. And the disciples want to know, And they're distressed and confused. And what do they do? They run. So we've got a lot of running. Look at verse 3. They're running because they want to know what happens. I hope you want to know what happened. Verse 3. So Peter went out with the other disciple. And they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Stop there. Okay, John's faster. We get it. John's faster, he's younger, he's also writing this story down, and he wants us to know that he won the race. (laughs) You think that's the only reason it's written in Scripture? The reason this is written down is because this is how you talk when you're telling a story. Uh, Can you believe what happened? This happened this week, and I was doing this, and everyone's wondering, why are you telling me all of these details? It's because they're excited about what they're telling you, and they're throwing these real details in to let you know it really happened. So this week, Travis and I were walking down the hallway, and I got into the break room first. (laughs) See that? Because he let me in. Thanks, Travis. 
Nobody cares about that fact. I was driving this past week and I had to merge onto 422. Your prayers were appreciated. And I got in in front of another car. So what? So what? Why does this matter? This matters. Because the memory of John and Peter is so clear, not because they ran a race and John won, but because of what they found to be true when they got there. The most important event in human history, all the details matter. Look at verse 5. We're running. I got there first. And stooping to look in, this is Peter, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. I'm sorry, that was John. 6, verse 6 is Peter. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and he went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head. Not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Friends, all of these details matter. This is what they found in Jesus' tomb. Not a body and not evidence of a robbery. They found his clothes that he was buried in and they found his face cloth neatly folded up. That's why the clothing is so important. First, there's darkness, which the world is in and was in without Jesus and the light of Jesus. But second, there's running because something amazing happened. And before I get to the clothing, let me ask you a question. Has your last week or month or year or life just been full of darkness? Have you discovered the light of Jesus? Do you have the hope of having your sins forgiven? Of being called clean and loved by your Creator? of knowing that you have everlasting life, that your funeral isn't the end of your story? Do you have that hope or are you still in darkness? Friends, Mary Magdalene showed up that first Easter morning and she was in darkness too. And Peter and John ran to that tomb and what they found was that everything the Bible says about Jesus is true. He really is the light. If you're in darkness... Won't you listen today to the evidence of what they found and how it changed the world? We want your life to be changed too. Let's pay close attention to the clothing. There's darkness, there's running, and third, we've got clothing. Next week, we'll get to watch as Mary Magdalene comes to learn what was happening. And this account is enough for the reader to understand. The clothing was folded. How many of you like clothes? Folding clothing. Okay. There's a, hey, I saw more hands than I was expecting. Um, is there like a rule on this? If you come back from the dead, make your bed? Was this like, this is the policy? If you come back from, fold your burial cloth? Have you ever folded your burial clothes? Nobody here. Nobody here. Uh, but one guy did. I used to work at Old Navy in the 1990s, one of my first jobs. And I learned how to fold clothing. And I can tell you, when you drop any piece of clothing, it does not land nicely folded. I have evidence and expertise on the topic. Why was there a piece of folded clothing in the tomb of Jesus? Peter arrives in verse 6. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Stop there. So Peter arrives. He goes in. He's confused. Mary's confused. John's confused. John's happy that he made it there first. And Peter sees that the clothing Jesus was buried in is there. And the face cloth, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a cloth they put over a face as the body is decomposing. The face cloth was folded nicely. It had been on Jesus' face Friday night. It was folded and it was in its own place. The story that the soldiers go on to tell and that in the first century when they tried to find Jesus' body, the Romans wanted to find it, the Jews wanted evidence of it, they wanted to snuff out and stop the rise of Christianity. All they had to do was find the body. And so one of the stories they came up with was, well, maybe the disciples came and took the body. 
Or maybe somebody stole the body. But if you stole the body or moved the body, why would you unwrap it and then nicely fold the face cloth? You unwrap gifts. You unwrap packages. You don't unwrap bodies that you're moving. It wouldn't make any sense. What was going on? Peter was confused. John was starting to figure it out. And here is the moment we see in John's life where he realizes that there's hope in this world. That in a world full of darkness, there can be light. Look at verse 8. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Jesus said, I'm going to be killed. I'm going to rise again. The prediction was that a Messiah would die for the sins of his people, but defeat death. That is what happened, and the clothing is evidence of that. There's a lot more evidence to come in the coming weeks as we study the rest of the Gospel of John. But the empty tomb by itself is not indisputable proof. Many have offered alternative explanations. And for skeptics, it was certainly falsifiable. All they had to do in the first century was produce the body, but they couldn't find it because there was no body to be found. He had been raised from the dead. His body was walking around, not hidden somewhere wrapped in its clothing. For the disciples, the empty tomb was the last piece of the puzzle. They were starting to piece it all together. That's right. Jesus said he had to die, but he would be raised. As they thought back on Jesus' life and teachings, it all started to make sense. This must be what he meant. Death really has been defeated. Death was no longer the end. And John here believes at the tomb. Peter would believe a little bit later. Mary believes a little bit later that morning. And for the last 2,000 years, billions of people stuck in darkness and confusion have come to see Jesus as their Lord and Savior and have had the light of Jesus break into their homes, break into their hearts, into their workplaces, into their marriages, into their finances, into their calendars, into their phones, and deliver them from the darkness all around them. Billions have Believed. And for those billions, everyone who repents and believes in Jesus, death is no longer the end. It's not just a little bit of wisdom on how to live a better life for a few more years that you have left. No, it's death no longer being the end of your story. The clothing was the proof. His body was not stolen or moved. It certainly hadn't decomposed in that time. He came back from death because death could not hold him. Oh, if only people would believe. Does your heart burn in compassion for those in our world around us? Friends, neighbors, students, co-workers, strangers who are stuck in darkness, who have no hope in this world. Your heart, like the Lord's heart, should despair in compassion for them, should burn in compassion for them. But not despair, because we have hope. But how many of us try so hard to have eternal life now instead of trusting the promise of eternal life later. Think about it. Have you spent most of your time or energy or resources on yourself trying to make this world so full of light that you've forgotten the promise of light and life in the world to come? How many of us try so hard to make this place bearable until we die and that's all we're really living for? How many of us put all of our hopes and dreams in this life when it can be all gone in just a second. Consider the new fad. Maybe you've heard of this fad of trying to live forever in this earth. Uh, on Time Magazine had an article this week about a guy who's trying to live forever. I mean, he's really, really trying to live forever. And he's got unlimited money to make it happen. So it was in Time Ma Magazine this week. His name's Brian Johnson. Millions of dollars have been invested into what he calls blueprint. 
It's a system of him, all these experts, health gurus, doctors, and they all get to chime in on what he does every minute of his day. Exactly when he goes to bed, how he sleeps, what pillow he uses, what he eats, what he doesn't eat, when he uses the restroom. Every single decision he has let these experts tell him how to live. He takes 111 pills a day. Because he wants eternal life. So he's given his life over to this system. The reporter says, quote, He thinks of any act that accelerates aging, like eating a cookie or getting less than eight hours of sleep, as an act of violence. I've been very violent this week. <laughs> Had more than one cookie. A reporter, the reporter visited his home and the reporter wrote, The home is beautiful and devoid of clutter, with floor-to-ceiling windows looking out on the pool and lush greenery outside. It reminds me of an apple store in a jungle. And listen to this. Uh, one of his employees meets me and greets me with a little bowl of special chocolate, which has been stripped of heavy metals and sourced only from regions with high polyphenol density. It tastes like a foot. Ew. <laughs> Friends, here's the saddest thing about all this. This man wants to live forever. And he's letting experts and gurus tell him how to live his life so that he can achieve eternal life. He says, this is Brian Johnson himself, he, he's quoted to say, Most people assume death is inevitable. We're just basically trying to prolong the time we have before we die. And then he says this, listen to this. I don't think there's been any time in history where humans could say with a straight face that death may not be inevitable. Isn't that interesting? He doesn't want God to tell him how to live. He's going to let a panel of experts tell him how to make every single decision, hoping they will give him eternal life. Oh, if only there were a better offer. God gives us counsel on how to live, and he offers us eternal life. And not only if we perfectly obey, but in spite of the fact that we've disobeyed, the offer from God is to submit our lives to him and he will forgive us of our failure to live perfectly and give us the gift of eternal life. Amen? There is an offer by faith in Jesus who is alive, who folded his own face cloth or had the angel do it for him. He defeated death and nobody in this offer has to eat anything that tastes like a foot. I wish I could meet this man and tell him about the clothing and how some people stuck in darkness were running for light and they found the clothing. And since John and Peter saw those burial clothes, I want to tell this man there has been a time in history where humans can say with a straight face that death is not inevitable. We can say that. Jesus is the light of the world. The darkness could not stop him. He offers his life so that even when we die, there's an eternity ahead with no pain, no suffering, and no darkness. Verse 8, one last time. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. He believed. Mary saw and ran. She'll come to believe in next week's message. And she gets the best and most amazing evidence. Peter saw and would eventually believe. John saw and he believed. And there it is. Someone sees the evidence of the risen Savior and believes. If you've never believed in Jesus, you've got darkness. And you have a man who died to give you light and life. Won't you trust in him? Won't you believe in him instead of paying professionals and trying to earn eternal life your own way? Won't you trust in Jesus? But friends, if you're a Christian and there's an area of your life 
your marriage, your parenting, your relationship with your parents, school, your neighborhood, your workplace, your heart, your phone, your Netflix, whatever it is that right now is darkness and you're enslaved by some of those things, won't you stare at Jesus and ask him to give you his light for that area so that tomorrow you wake up not in darkness but in light? He died to purchase that for you. He died to purchase that for you. We have darkness, which the world and our hearts are in without Jesus. And then we have running because something amazing had happened. And then there's clothing, proof that death had been defeated. What Jesus offers is light now and life after death. When you repent and believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior, death is no longer the end. Friends, his tomb is empty. They didn't take the body. He rose from the dead and his face cloth was folded nicely and neatly because Jesus will never again need burial clothes. And neither will anyone who trusts in Jesus. He is the light of the world. He is risen Will you trust him today? Brothers and sisters in Christ, let's end like we do on Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. One more time. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let me pray. Father, this world was full of darkness and hopelessness because of my sin and the sins of every man and woman. And you saw the darkness and you sent your son to walk into the darkness and to shine his light. Father, help us trust the light of Jesus for every area of our life. Help us confess our sins and turn from the darkness in our lives and trust Jesus more and more each day. Lord, may your light shine in our hearts, our homes, our neighborhoods, and in our world. And Father, send us out into this world, not as the light, but as those who testify to the light. And give us great compassion and love for those around us stuck in darkness. Help the, us love them like Jesus loves them. And Father, build your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And let your light shine for our good and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you please stand one last time and join us in worship? One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. The word became flesh and the life shined among us, his glory revealed. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins.
The true light, Jesus, shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That's really, really good news. You could try a couple hundred million dollars and 111 pills a day and food that tastes like feet. That's what people are willing to do to find the hope that you cannot get anywhere apart from Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ died on the cross and defeated death to give you that light and life. If you need that, if you're despairing right now, stay and let us love you. Let us point you away from ourselves to Jesus who can give you hope and light in your world today. Students, this week on Wednesday, see you at the pole. We will be praying for you that God would give you courage to do that or to stand up for Jesus however he calls you to do it. On the bus, in the neighborhood, wherever that might be. Students, we're praying for you and rooting for you. We have your backs. And friends, if you wanted to learn more about supporting the program that we have in the foyer, we'll have more information. You can go across to the foyer to the library to learn about the program that we talked about in Sunday school to support local Christian schools. We want God's kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And it's not just the folded face cloth that is the proof. No, Jesus is risen. So let me end with an encouraging benediction. And then I'll say that last phrase and we'll all end with, he is risen indeed. Brothers and sisters, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. He is risen. He is risen indeed. God bless you.